Hi, and welcome to Straight Shot Radio. My name is Johnny Slick, and I'm the founder and head coach at Straight Shot Training, a remote personal training company with an emphasis on helping people of all fitness levels feel better, move better, and live better with progressive functional strength and conditioning workouts. Welcome to 2021, everybody. I hope you are ready to get this year off to a great start, and hopefully today's episode can be a part of that. You see, last episode, I talked about resolving your pain being a great goal for 2021. Well, in order to get rid of your pain, you have to identify what it is. You need to know why you have it, how to treat it, and then how to avoid it in the future. Today's episode has a lot about all of that, specifically in reference to shoulder and hip impingement. Dr. Garrett Foland from Kinetics Physiotherapy and Performance in Mount Holly, North Carolina, joins me today in this episode to explain the anatomy and biomechanics behind impingement, what causes it, what the symptoms are, and how he treats it as a physical therapist. He also gives you what exercises you can do to avoid it and what not to do if you have it so you can get on the road to resolving your hip and shoulder pain that comes from impingement. Before we jump into that, though, I want to talk to you about the importance of having a workout program and a coach to hold you accountable. You'll hear in this episode one of the risk factors for developing impingement, particularly in the shoulder, is muscular imbalances. And this is where one side of a joint is stronger or tighter than the other side, pulling the bones in a position they aren't meant to move in. And over time, that may lead to pain throughout the joint and into the surrounding muscles. One of the best ways to avoid muscular imbalances and poor movement patterns is getting a coach who will write a program that properly works your entire body in proper balance and actually helps you loosen up those stiff muscles while strengthening up those weak muscles. Just today, we actually lowered the upfront cost of workout programming and coaching through our app, so it's never been easier to get going with a straight shot coach. We also offer virtual personal training sessions so we can further help you by breaking down your movement, fixing bad movement patterns, and get you moving better and feeling awesome. If you are interested in making 2021 your fittest year ever, I want you to head over to straightshottraining.com, click request a coach to get in contact with me personally, and we'll make it happen together. All right, let's get into impingement with Dr. Garrett Folland. All right, welcome back to the show, Dr. Garrett Foland. Uh, welcome, Garrett. Last time we talked to you, this was back in, I think, August. We talked about mobility issues uh, during quarantine and how you do things at Kinetics Physiotherapy and Performance. Uh, and we wanted to have you back on today to discuss a, some pretty common issues that people might run into. So thanks for joining us again. Yeah, thanks for having me back on the show, Johnny. It's always nice yep. being here. Yep. So uh, we talked before a little bit about issues that people might be having. We talked about, you know, knees and low back and some shoulder stuff back in our quarantine mobilities uh, episode, quarantine mobility issues, sorry, episode back in August. But something that uh, we wanted to talk about today is shoulder and hip impingement. And obviously there's a lot of different things that can cause shoulder and hip pain, but would you say this is one of the more common ones that causes those pains? Uh, shoulder, shoulder pain, certainly I would say out of uh, the patients that we see with shoulder pain impingement is easily 50%. Okay. And then hip, what about with hip impingement? Um, common, not, not nearly as common as shoulder impingement. Shoulder, so impingement. shoulder impingement is one of those things we see uh, multiple times a day, hip impingement, um, maybe a few times a month. Got it. Okay. Uh, so then let's, let's start with shoulder impingement here. What is shoulder impingement? So I think it's important to, and I think it'll be useful to look at shoulder anatomy, just to kind of get an idea of the structures around the shoulder that are involved with impingement. So the shoulder, as most of you know, is a uh, ball and socket joint. So you have the the humeral head, the top of your arm bone, and it sits on top of the glenoid, which is kind of the side of the shoulder blade. And it's a very unstable joint uh, if you're looking just at the bony anatomy. Um, I compare it to a golf ball sitting on a tee. Uh, you know, I, I was just, I was just about to, to use that. Uh, yeah. I was just yeah, about to use that an, analogy because it's, it's not a like perfect the, analogy. Uh, yeah. <laughs> Cause it's different than the hip. Cause the hip is more enclosed than a shoulder is. Yeah. Yep. Yeah, certainly. 
Um, so if you're looking at the, if you're comparing the bony anatomy, yes, they are both similar because they're both ball and socket joints, but the, the hip is much more stable um, in terms of the bony aspects of it. Uh, so what the shoulder has to do to, to remain nice and stable is rely on other structures. So you have um, a labrum, which is basically a uh, cartilaginous ring that sits around that glenoid and it deepens that socket or the golf tee creates like a suction almost. And then you have a series of ligaments that go around the joint. And then of course you have muscles that kind of hold the joint in place too. Um, talking about the shoulder, uh, mostly concerned with the rotator cuff muscles, which is a group of muscles that uh, essentially grab the top of the arm, that humeral head and pull it in towards the socket and they create stability that way. So, so almost, really like a, almost like a suction cup holding the golf ball against the tee. Exactly. Yep. They kind of shunt it in. They have other functions, but, um, you know, I think we, we overlook that shunting function of the uh, rotator cuff too often because that's one of its most important jobs. Yeah. Um, so above that shoulder joint, you have your collarbone that comes out and it meets up with another aspect of the shoulder blade. Um, and that creates almost like a little archer, like a little roof over the shoulder joint. And the space between the shoulder joint and that little arch is called the subacromial space. And this is where we see subacromial impingement. And this is um, more prevalent in older, I don't want to say older individuals, let's say over 40. Um, and this is typically something that kind of comes on slow and steady. Uh, it, as opposed to another type of impingement that we'll look at, which is uh, kind of outside of the, or sorry, this is inside the joint, and this is more okay. prevalent in uh, throwers overhead athlete. That's um, that's the glenoid impingement as opposed to the subacromial impingement. Got it. Um, so let's let's stick with subacromial impingement for now, just because okay. I, I think it's a little bit more common. Um, it's something that I, I definitely see more often outside of you're, like my, you're more, my baseball yeah, you're players. More like, I was going to say, you're more likely to see subacromial in someone who's less active, right? Yeah. Yeah. Uh, um, yeah. Subacromial, um, less active, a little bit older, and it's really okay. caused by, by compression of the, the structures that are in that space, as opposed to like an instability or a, um, hyper mobility issue like a lot of baseball players have or overhead athletes I should say okay okay but anyway so as it, that space there that subacromial space that we're talking about um, underneath the roof of the end of the clavicle or your collarbone and above the shoulder joint there's rotator cuff tendons that come through there's um, the bicep tendon there's a bursa which is basically a fluid filled sac which decreases friction um, so if that space doesn't uh, keep open throughout the motion, then it can kind of get pinched or impinged, which is okay. where we get this term from. <laughs> um, so typically what you'll see, um, if, if you're working with somebody or if you are somebody who's dealing with subacromial impingement is pain when you're reaching up overhead. A lot of times it's like a painful arc. So okay. once you get about the shoulder height with the arm, it starts to get painful. And then as you get up closer towards your ear, the, the pain resolves. Reaching across your body can be painful. Reaching back behind uh, your back, like if you're uh, putting your belt on or reaching into your pocket, those things can be painful. Uh, sleeping okay. on that side um, is, is generally painful. I'm sure a lot of people listening to this are, are, are resonating with, with this. Cause you, you, I, I mean, like, just like you said before, I, I have seen this a lot. Yeah. Oh yeah. It's um, it's definitely out there. I mean, I get patients that come in and um, you know, they've been looked at by different professionals and um, the treatment, if you can diagnose it properly, the treatment's relatively easy. You just got to figure out what's causing this. Um, that's, that's the tricky part. Um, Got it. subacromial impingement, relatively easy to fix. If you get the, the cause of it correct, um, and address that appropriately. Okay. Now, what would some of the symptoms of subacromial impingement be though? So you said, you know, pain in the arc, but is there any other symptoms, you know, is there like, is it a dull or sharp pain? What are people kind of looking for when it comes to pain? 
Yeah. So again, that, that, like you said, the painful arc, it's kind of like a, maybe a catching sensation. Um, you can have an ache. I would say more of like a dull ache on the side of the arm. Um, it, certainly it, with subacromial, it's more on, on the top of the shoulder, maybe a little bit more towards the front of the shoulder. Um, okay. If it's really front it, it, anterior, it might be some, some bicep tendon involved. Um, pain with overhead, like repetitive overhead motions. Um, and again, it's usually gradual onset. It's, it can be traumatic. It can be something that, that was caused by a fall or, you know, the dog pulling yeah. on the leash or something like that. But more often than not, it's something that kind of insidious, insidiously on. develops over time. Yeah. So this is, this is something where, you know, you might see it in somebody who is, is older or less active, but you might also see in someone who just does a lot of repetitive overhead pressing. Yeah. Yeah. They can, it can okay. develop like that too. Again, as, um, typically in, in the athletic population, if it's going to happen, it's, it's more of a mechanical issue or a muscle imbalance issue. Um, Got it. and like I said, Sta more once of a you can diagnose issue. that, it's, yeah, yeah, yeah exactly. Okay. okay. So, um, you know, talked about you know, what kind of what the symptoms are, uh, but what are some of the things you were kind of starting off with there before we, we started talking about symptoms, you're talking about causes and finding the causes of it. What do you think are most likely the causes for shoulder impingement? I would say the most common one is again, muscle imbalances. Um, okay. again, if you don't have adequate strength through that rotator cuff, because again, that's pulling that humeral head in and down, right? It's pulling it kind of yeah. down out of that subacromial space. Um, and you can actually see this on radiographs of people who've had complete tears, um, or if there's a lot of rotator cuff weakness, that humeral head will kind of migrate upward into that subacromial space. So um, a lot of it is just weakness of the rotator cuff. And again, treatment wise, pretty easy. You just strengthen the rotator cuff. You're also looking at things like um, what we call scapular dyskinesia, dyskinesia or um, the shoulder blade just not moving properly or not sitting um, in, in a proper location. Okay. Uh, those are, those are some of the more common causes of it. So from a treatment standpoint, you're treating this through movement, right? Uh, yeah. I, I, most cases are, are exercise based treatments. Um, if there is a case of, uh, tight joint capsule ligaments, um, tight muscles that might be altering joint mechanics, then certainly I'll use some manual treatments. Um, okay soft tissue mobilization, dry needling, cupping, uh, joint mobilizations, that sort of thing. Uh, but it almost always ends with some sort of exercise, exercise. treatment. Cause yeah. if, yeah, cause you want to be able to create a lasting change. So you might have to do some of those modalities to get the, the joint mobile enough to be able to do the exercises, but then the exercises strengthening up that rotator cuff, building that stability is what's going to have that person not getting shoulder impingement again. Yep. That's exactly um, it. Yeah. And then, I, that goes I, for I, most things that we treat in here. <laughs> that's true. <laughs> that's the best way of doing it. You know, you, you want to give people a, yeah. a fix, not a short term solution. But I, I think a big exactly. thing with this is that it, it, a lot of people, when they start hearing the words, you know, rotator cuff uh, and, you know, uh, subacromial uh, impingement, it, they can be scary words where people think they have to have surgery and it, impingement yeah. is not a tear. But, no, but it's, it, but it can lead to it. They're though, pretty right? closely related. Yeah. Yes, it can lead to it. And honestly, the, the treatment um, for like a partial tear and impingement are pretty similar. Gotcha. Um, so yeah, they're definitely related uh, pathologies. Certainly. Okay. Yeah. And but as just, far as, just because as far you as have surgery an... goes, go ahead. Yeah. I was, I was going to say it, just because you have impingement does not mean that you need rotator cuff surgery. No. No, yeah. <laughs> definitely, definitely not. Um, yeah. yeah. So, so if, if you find yourself with uh, like the symptoms that we talked about earlier, um, if they're acute, if it's been going on for a day or two, give it a week, you know, a lot of times these aches and pains just kind of come and go. Um, but if it's lingering on for a week and a half, two weeks, or certainly if it's getting worse, then I would get in and get evaluated um, by yeah. a therapist and start with treatment. So typically, uh, for if, if there's no red flags, if there's no major symptoms that I'm concerned about, I'll do treatment for four to six weeks. And in that time, we could, we should see some, some really good improvements. Uh, okay. maybe we're not a hundred percent, but we should know we're on the, on the right path. 
if we're not getting much from it, or again, if it's, if it's really not responding to therapy or getting worse, then um, the next step is typically uh, an injection. So and they'll again, they'll go right into that subacromial space and, and put steroids. Um, and, and that can be helpful for some people. Um, you know, you don't want to get injections for the rest of your life. So yes. the, the, <laughs> the next step after that, if you're not responding to injections, then then we're talking surgery. So there's a couple procedures. I don't know if you want to go into that or not, but um, we, can, we can go there if you're interested. Uh, I, I think for today, so we'll stick to sur surface, you know, what, what are people going to be able to, to start working on at home to avoid it? And then, you know, what, what they would typically do at a physical therapist, but obviously, yeah, if it gets to the point where your doctor says you need surgery, then you, then you need to get surgery, um, depending on the issue. Yep. But so how do people avoid this in the first place? You know, how do you avoid getting shoulder impingement? Uh, mostly just keeping good posture and uh, keeping good strength throughout the shoulders um, and not just, you know, the sexy deltoid muscle, but <laughs> the rest of the shoulder as well. Um, it, and, and just generally staying active and listening to your body. Um, like I said, if these things do kind of pop up, there can be acute swelling or inflammation in that space. And a lot of times it just kind of resolves itself. But if okay. it's lingering around, um, the treatment's going to be a lot better in more efficient if you get it checked out earlier rather than waiting six months. Um, yeah. so, so don't, don't delay if it's been bothering you for a couple of weeks, just get it checked out. Okay. And then what are your, you know, we're talking about strengthening up the, the rotator cuff and the shoulders. Can you give us you know, three of your, your favorite exercises for developing those muscles to help people not get into this issue in the first place? Um, certainly. So uh, we'll go with the classic shoulder external rotation. Um, okay. I mean, there's a number of ways to do this. You can do the sideline with a light dumbbell. Um, you can do, you can use an elastic band or, uh, even a cable machine with a really light weight. Keep in mind, this is a very isolated exercise. These muscles aren't really that strong. They're more, um, geared towards low load for long periods of time. So you don't have to one rep max your rotator cuff <laughs> muscles. Um, <laughs> I would, I would aim for, uh, between 12 and 20 reps for these kind of get that okay. burning sensation as opposed to, um, again, uh, five reps or less at heavier weight. There's just no need for that with this muscle group. Gotcha. Um, so you want to do the external rotation. Uh, you want to do the internal rotation. Um, a lot of people kind of avoid this and it can be irritable for some people, but it's still really important muscle to have nice and strong. Um, Absolutely. the, the internal rotator is significantly stronger. You know, that's one of the muscles that allows baseball players to throw the ball 90 miles an hour. Yeah. Um, obviously there's a lot more to it, but, um, do the internal rotation as well. You can go up and wait there, but still aiming for that challenging 12 to 20 reps. And then, um, you know, I'm going to throw a curveball at you here. Okay. Uh, yep. the last one, let's, let's say something to avoid. Okay. So oh, if, yeah, good if you suspect that you have um, subacromial impingement, again, pain re when reaching behind the back, when reaching across your, your body, um, kind of that painful arc, then I want you to avoid heavy deltoid exercises. Um, okay. So lateral raises, front raises, overhead press, um, anything that's really activating that deltoid is going to shunt that humeral head up. So temporarily, right? I never tell anybody not to do an exercise, or I should say very rarely do I tell somebody not to do an exercise for the rest of their life. Um, but until this resolves, I would kind of stay away from heavy delt activity and just focus okay. on giving the other muscles a chance to catch up. Got it. Uh, and then what about, I know, uh, for me personally, people with, with shoulder impingement typically do better with exercises pushing or pulling where their elbows are closer to their sides. And is that because the higher your elbow is positioned that the, the humerus is being shoved upwards towards the acromium? Is that the mechanism behind why arms close yeah. to you? Okay. That's so exactly maybe. it. Once your arm. Yeah. So typically if your arms just red, resting at your side, you, your subacromial space is, I want to say like 12 millimeters. And okay. at 90 degrees of abduction, um, it, that's it's when your elbow comes out to the side. So again, okay. Yep. Yep. So now that space is roughly half that size. So again, wow. if you already have swelling or something in there, you're going to start to feel that. So at that point, you're just mashing the muscle in between two bones. 
<laughs> right? Yeah. <laughs> Pretty much by the time you get that high. Uh, okay. So maybe something else somebody could do then if they're having shoulder issues, uh, they're doing their internal rotation, they're doing their external rotation and they're avoiding a lot of deltoid exercises. They, if they keep their elbows close to them on, you know, rows or, um, like a neutral grip dumbbell bench press that might give them some, some ways to work around something that's going to exacerbate their issue then. Yes. Yeah, absolutely. Okay. So the, one of the, one of the principles that we always go by here at kinetic is d- do what you can. We don't want to say, Hey, uh, you have shoulder impingement. You take off some time from the gym. No, that's, that's not our thing. Yeah. <laughs> uh, we're going to find other ways that you can still get strong and stay fit. Um, maybe back some, some specific things off or, modify some things, but, um, okay. yeah, it's not an excuse to, to skip on your workout. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> uh, so let's roll right into then, then hips and, and I'm just so we can kind of really get into this one here. The, uh, what the, some of the symptoms are the mechanism behind the impingement is, is kind of similar, right? It's slightly different. So in, in the shoulder, right, we talked about um, the rotator cuff and the bursa and those sorts of things being impinged. Yeah. With the hip, uh, again, that, that hip socket is deeper. Um, and there's really two variants of hip impingement. You have a cam morphology, which is basically a little bump on the, okay. the top of the femur. And when you flex the hip or internally rotate or abduct, or sorry, adduct typically, um, then that little bump is going to hit onto the, uh, the socket. Okay. Um, so, th- and then you also have a pincer morphology, which is when the, the socket is uh, larger or deeper than desired. And um, as the humeral head moves up, it's kind of hitting on that. that so it's not I'm necessarily sorry. the femoral head. Yeah. Oh, did I say humeral? Yeah, I'm sorry. Yeah, I, yeah. I just yeah. want to make sure I'm tracking. Yeah. Yes, yeah. Fe- the femoral yeah. head yeah. Runs, yeah. runs into it as it's coming up. Yes, exactly. Got it. Okay. Um, so, and typically it's not the, the bone that's really irritated. It's the, it's the structures around it. Um, in this case, it's a lot of times the, um, the labrum, the acetabular labrum, um, okay. which again, we have one in the shoulder, pretty much the same thing down in the hip. Got it. So what are then some of the, the symptoms that you would get? Um, b- burning? pain, pinching pain, numb pain, or or dull pain? What do you feel when you have hip impingement? So typically it's going to be like groin area pain. Hip impingement's um, quite a bit different in terms of the diagnostic portion, just because um, when you get into the hip, uh, there's a lot of moving pieces as far as referral from, from internal organs, from the lower back, from the SI joint. So there's a lot more to tease out and it's not quite as black and white. Um, as but the typically it's going to be, yeah, yeah. The shoulder, um, again, shoulder's not a perfect example either, but, um, the hip can be a little more challenging. Um, definitely an x-ray here would be helpful to see the, uh, again, those little bumps, those, okay. those changes in, in the bone. Um, in, in fact, I think it is required for a, uh, a diagnosis of, uh, hip impingement, but, uh, so again, groin area pain. Typically, you're going to see that with hip flexion, so bringing the knee up towards the chest, or okay. um, if you're looking at like a closed chain position, uh, deep squats, um, okay. and then internal rotation of the hip and adduction of the hip. Those are kind of the classic motions that that cause pain. Um, you can have the the little bony bumps on different parts of the joint, which can cause pain with different motions, but not quite as common, actually not nearly as common. Okay. And then the causes of hip impingement, is it kind of similar to, to the demographic and the, the movement habits of the people who get shoulder impingement or what is it exactly that's causing that hip impingement then? So there's, a, there's quite a bit of research going on on this. Um, uh, I, I think it's roughly 25% of the population, asymptomatic population has these morphologies right? Oh, so they wow. either have a cam or pincer morphology. So there's a chance okay. that, you know, I have one right now. I just yeah. <laughs> don't have symptoms of it. Um, what we do know is out of that 25%, uh, the majority of those were athletes growing up um, huh. in their teenage years. Um, okay. So so a lot of times these things develop when you are a, a young athlete, and then they don't really 
cause any problems until you're, you know, mid twenties to, to 40, I would say it's more typical age range for, for this to kind of manifest. Okay. So then what is the, the treatment of these? Cause I, I mean, like you said before, there's, this, there's, it could be several different things. Plus, you know, there's so many other things going on in the hip. Um, do you typically get a, an MRI or an x-ray before you start treating what you think might be hip impingement? If I had someone walking off the street with hip pain and I did my evaluation and um, was led to believe that it was a hip impingement, I wouldn't refer them right away to get okay. an x-ray or MRI. Um, I would work with them for a while. And if things weren't improving, again, I'd give it about a month um, and, and, and then probably send them out to get it examined further if it weren't responding to PT. Um, okay. But as far as treatment goes, uh, it's really, this is slightly different. This is really uh, case by case. So um, you got really got to get in there and do a good physical exam and figure out what muscles are involved, because a lot of times you're going to have hip weakness with this. Um, hip adduction is is pretty weak with this. Uh, I, I see that pretty often. Um, Ad, adduction for the abdominals. Anyone. Um, just, just real quick, when, yeah, you, yeah. when, you're, when you're saying adduction, it's it, ADD, meaning the, the legs are coming together. So if you're sitting on the adductor machine, it's when you're sitting and you're pressing your legs together. Yep. Kind of working so, the, the, the groin muscles. The, the inner thigh muscles. Yep. Just so, it's, so there's no confusion there. So, so people have a weakness or instability in the adductors. Uh, what else are you seeing with them? Uh, a lot of times there's uh, some sort of trunk weakness. Um, okay. So I do some testing on there just to kind of see where we stand with trunk weakness. And I always compare bilaterally with the legs to have them do some single leg um, tests to see how they respond to that. And, okay. and based on the findings of that exam, uh, we, we coordinate their plan of care and um, decide on their treatment. But most of this is, um, again, it's going to be exercise-based therapy uh, that irritation of the labrum. A lot of times you get irritation of the hip flexor muscles. Um, so some manual treatment is, I, I do perform some manual treatments here, just more for pain relief and kind of calming down muscles that are irritated. I do some joint mobilizations. Um, haven't found them to be like too wildly helpful for this, but uh, for short-term pain relief, they do, they do work. So then kind of same thing that we're rolling with, with the, the shoulder impingement in avoiding it in the first place. Uh, but it sounds like this one is, is a little trick. It seems like this was a little trickier than, you know, just making sure that you, that you have a, a stable rotator cuff. Um, what types of exercises though do you think people can be doing just in a regular basis that might help them lessen their risk of developing hip impingement? I, it, the big one I think is just kind of working into things slowly and feeling it out and seeing how you respond to it. Um, so, you know, if you're going to start doing CrossFit, maybe don't jump in and do a full depth squat on day one. You know, if you've never <laughs> done that before, okay. uh, you know, things like that. So start slow with activities and just kind of feel it out, listen to your body, see how it feels. Um, the other part of the treatment kind of combining those last two questions is, activity modification. Sometimes we might have to change um, some things and say, you know what, if running kind of irritates it, let's just run every other day. You don't need to be running every single day. So okay. sometimes just modifying activity can be helpful as well. And, you know, you could probably still still squat if you had hip impingement, but you might just have to modify it to a box squat or something that's not going to involve as much hip flexion. Yep. Yeah. So, yep. so, so same, same thing. I, I think, and that's, I think it's cool the way that you, you approach that is that, you know, you do, you do what you can exactly what you all say, you know, there's still plenty of things that you can do while you're dealing with this. But I think people have this idea of, I either need to do my exact routine or I need to completely rest. Yeah, exactly. And, and, but, and your, your exact routine could be exacerbating your issue and complete rest is not going to really work to fix it. Um, there's plenty of yeah. stuff that you, that you can do. Um, so now you talked before about strengthening up the rotator cuff. How important do you think hip rotation exercises are when it comes to hip impingement? Um, I, it's important. I, I wouldn't say it's as important. Um, okay. but again, you still have a group of muscles that kind of act like a rotator cuff to the hip. Um, but again, I think for me personally, what I've seen is more, um, again, that, that, inner thigh, that adduction strengthening is more beneficial and more trunk and core strengthening. 
um, those things for me, I think, uh, have, have given me greater success. Got it. So Co- Copenhagen plank. Yeah, go for okay. it. Okay. Yeah. <laughs> for, for those of you who, who aren't training with us and uh, get the Copenhagen plank in your workouts, it's a side plank where your top leg is up on a bench and your bottom leg, there's a bunch of different variations of it, but essentially your top leg is holding you up. So you're having to use the strength of your inner thighs. You can do it with your knee on the bench as well to modify it. Uh, so you're strengthening the stability of that inner thigh up. So um, you don't have to sit on an inner thigh machine to work your adductors. There's lots of ways of doing it. And that's a, that's a tough one there. So what, the, 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 caution. The, the Copenhagen plank. Oh, absolutely. No, I always tell people start with your knee on the bench, which is kind of a tricky setup in some uh, areas, especially if you're trying to do it on your couch or something, but yeah, start with your knee on the bench. So your leg isn't completely straight out when you do the Copenhagen plank, but what's an easier uh, exercise for adductors that you like? I mean, a really basic one would just be like a ball or a pillow squeeze. Um, oh, cool. I mean, okay. De- That's going to do a home. Depending on, depending on uh, what level the patient is. Otherwise I'll use bands and have them standing doing adduction that way. Okay. Um, so a band, yeah, attached certainly. To, a band attached to something around your foot and then almost like a sideways kick across the front of your body. Yep. Or yeah. step way out to the side and pull it towards the other foot. If that Got makes it. sense. Okay. Sometimes a, a visual is helpful when there's yeah, I'm, I'm trying. I'm trying to. I'm trying to to explain this as I'm sitting in a a 31 degree uh, shed right now, uh, trying to explain <laughs> the exercise. Um, so inner inner strengthening inner thighs, and then what about unilateral leg exercises? You know, uh, lunges, step ups. Do you think people need to be doing doing more of those uh, in their programs to help out with this? Again, if they can tolerate it, um, absolutely. Yeah, I'm, okay. I'm a big fan of doing um, like single leg box squats. Uh, I okay. use it um, kind of to track progress and track strength and also compare bilaterally. So, um, yeah, that certainly lunges. Um, it, yeah, if, if they can tolerate it. Um, and when I say that, I do want to make a point about uh, pain, hip pain with impingement. If you can get to the point where where you're doing things with, a, like I call it a green level pain. So if we're looking at that zero to 10 pain scale, if we're one, two or three, I'm kind of okay with that. You know, it's kind of that nagging type pain, but it should resolve quickly afterwards. And, you know, most people can kind of live with that. And then you get to the yellow area, which is four, five, six, maybe seven. Um, That's when, you know, we're going to have to modify activity a little bit more. And then, you know, after that, eight, nine, 10, that's, that's when we kind of, you know, pump the brakes a little bit and look at what other options we can go to. So with this, you're not necessarily going to make it worse if you're in that green level of pain. I think that, I think that's important. And, and it, you probably would say the same thing with the shoulder, right? When someone first starts doing external rotation with uh, a shoulder impingement issue, it might be a little uncomfortable, but as long as it's not you know, searing hot pain, uh, they're not going to do any more damage. Yeah. Yeah. It should be. And it, and it should get better over time too. And it shouldn't last. It shouldn't linger around after you're doing exercises. If you did your exercises on Sunday and you're still feeling it on Wednesday, um, eh, maybe that's <laughs> maybe that's not for you right now. And I think it's important for people to communicate that then back to their therapist. There has to be that that exchange so that the therapist can understand how to change things. So it sounds like yeah. you know you appro- you approach things with with so much individuality depending on the person and what they're able to handle and what their, their needs are that, you know, the more they can communicate to you as their therapist, the better you can treat them going forward. Absolutely. And, you know, just to make a point on that, and this is something I talk to other therapists about, it drives me crazy when I see therapists on Instagram and it's like, Hey, do these three exercises for back pain. It's like, there are, you know how many causes of back pain there are? (laughs) Uh, Like you can't, (laughs) So, so if, if you're somebody out there dealing with whether it's shoulder, hip, back, it doesn't matter. Don't just blindly follow exercises that you saw on Instagram. You're, you are unique. You have your own set of circumstances. You get addressed and get a specific program for you. You're going to yes. get better a whole lot faster and you're going to avoid potentially messing something up. So Great. I try to make that a point <laughs> when, I, when I talk to you too. I just think it's really important um, – you know, most physical therapists are pretty highly trained. Most of us, I think, do a really good job. But a big part of what we do is assessment. And without yeah. assessment, how can we really treat somebody? Yeah, so I think it's, it's, it's great, you know, that you're able to, to explain shoulder impingement, hip impingement, what people can do and 
and ways to avoid it. But ultimately, you know, if someone's, if someone's feeling this, like you said, for, you know, more than a couple of days after a workout and they've given a little bit of time and it's, it's still there, uh, it's time they need to go see you or, or another qualified professional so that they can really go at this thing correctly. Yep, definitely. Cool. Well, awesome. Well, thank you so much for, for coming on Garrett. You drop a, a ton of knowledge. This has taken me back to my, uh, my anatomy classes, like geez, 13 years ago, <laughs> but, uh, yeah, yeah, well, I, 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 I appreciate you having me on. Yeah, this is, I mean, it's, it's always super helpful. We, we look forward to having you back on a lot more uh, throughout this upcoming year. Awesome. Well, uh, I'll, I'll be here when you need me. <laughs> Sounds good. Thanks so much, man. Take care. Thank you so much for listening today. I really appreciate it. If you could like this episode or leave us a rating, subscribe to the show, or share this episode with a friend who may be experiencing some shoulder or hip pain, that would be awesome and it would help us out a lot. Again, we want to help you move better and as a result feel much better and have more energy and do the things that you want to do in life, but we can't help you if we don't know that you need help right? So I want you to head over to straightshottraining.com, check out what it is that we do over there, and then hit me up either via the contact form on the homepage or just click the request a coach button and let's chat about it. See if we can help you. While you're over there, be sure to join the Straight Shot email club to get exclusive content, deals, and giveaways. Thank you so much for listening and have a great week, everybody. 